What happens when the natural disaster that's been threatening the galaxy turns out to not be so natural after all? Let's smash a couple of well-worn Star Trek tropes together and find out! This is a review of The Examples, the fifth episode of Star Trek Discovery's fourth season. If you're watching this before you've seen the episode, don't worry, this review is spoiler-free. After a couple of okay but aimless episodes, The Examples is a nice return to form. Not a great episode, and not as good as the excellent second episode of this season, Anomaly, but strong, with some very nice character beats, and most importantly, a sense of forward momentum. Things are happening. Important things. Interesting things. Things that leave me wanting to see what happens next. The A story this time, and the one from which the episode takes its title, follows Captain Burnham and Book as they try to rescue a handful of prisoners who have been abandoned by their society during an evacuation. An asteroid colony is in the path of the DMA, and when Burnham points out to the colony's leader that everyone is ready to be transported to safety except half a dozen people who don't seem to be going anywhere, the colony's leader is like, oh, yeah, those are the examples. We sentenced them to life in prison to show everyone else that crime doesn't pay. Screw them. Just leave them there. It turns out most of the examples have been imprisoned for petty crimes. And this is reminiscent of classic episodes from past Star Trek shows, including Justice from TNG, where the Enterprise encounters a society where every crime, no matter how minor, could potentially result in the death penalty. Deep Space Nine's Tribunal, where we see that all trials on Cardassia are predetermined, the verdict is always guilty, and staged for the benefit of the public, and maybe even a little bit of the original series episode A Taste of Armageddon, where the Enterprise visits a planet that is waging a simulated war that results in real casualties in the form of people from the population who are selected by computer and executed. Our heroes encountering a society with a cruel system of punishment that they nonetheless regard as superior is a sturdy Star Trek trope that we've been getting variations on for decades now. It's an excellent opportunity to explore the tensions between respecting the beliefs and rights of another person or another society and doing what you believe is right. And those tensions are a great place to find conflict and story. How far do you go to respect the laws and traditions of another culture? When do you feel entitled to disregard those laws and traditions? These are the sorts of questions Captain Burnham and Book, but mostly Captain Burnham because it's ultimately her call, face in this episode, and it yields a compelling result. Compelling, but not perhaps as compelling as it might be. The roadblocks Burnham and Book encounter on their way into and out of the prison complex feel like stretching exercises, as though the writers feared they didn't have quite enough material for this story, so they threw in a few obstacles for the characters to get through in between the actually interesting stuff. That ends up being a relatively minor complaint, though. The resolution of the prison rescue story is satisfying enough and concludes with three nicely drawn character beats in a row. First, a confession from one of the prisoners that's been a long time coming. Second, Burnham getting to tell the leader of the now-destroyed former colony just what she thinks of his shitty society, which gave me simultaneous Kirk and Picard vibes, a neat trick to pull off. And third, Burnham returning a precious family artifact to someone whose life was affected by one of the prisoners many years ago. All in all, some really good work here. The B story follows Stamets, Saru, Jet Reno making a very welcome return, and Ruan Tarka, a scientist who has also been studying the DMA, who arrives to combine his efforts with Stamets. Recent behavior of the anomaly has led Stamets to conclude that it's not a natural phenomenon at all, but something that was artificially constructed. But who would have the power to make something so massive and destructive, and why? Those questions are left unanswered 
for the time being, as the focus in this episode turns to Stamets and Tarka conducting a risky experiment in an attempt to learn more about the nature of the DMA. With a nervous Saru and a skeptical Reno looking on and assisting, Stamets and Tarka construct a scale model of the DMA in order to observe it. But, this being Star Trek, the model threatens to grow beyond their control and threaten the safety of the ship. I won't spoil whether or not the model does grow out of control and destroy the ship, but I will point out that this is episode five of what will apparently be an 11 episode season. So, you know, draw your own conclusions. The main function of this part of the episode is to introduce us to Tarka, who will apparently be an important recurring presence from now on. I wasn't sure about him at first. For most of the episode, he comes across as an off-the-shelf rebel scientist type. He's a dick, but he's brilliant and he gets results. Like a store brand Tony Stark, most of his big character moments are cliches, like when he tries to throw Saru off balance by screaming in his face and then inviting Saru to scream back at him. None of it is bad exactly, but it just feels like we've seen this character before, and this particular version doesn't bring anything new or especially interesting to the table. But then there's a final scene between Tarka and Book, who haven't interacted at all up to this point because Book was part of Burnham's story, and in that scene there's some promise, promise for where the story of the season might go from here, and promise that Tarka could turn out to be a much more interesting character than he has been so far. Speaking of interesting character insights, we also get a f we all And speaking of interesting character insights, we also get to see a few more cracks in the saintly facade of Dr. Colbert in this episode, which is very good to see. I mentioned last time that I felt like they were making Colbert a bit too perfect, but obviously the writers of the show were way ahead of me on that one. One of the strongest themes of Discovery from the beginning has been how we deal with trauma. Culber is a great choice for a character through which to explore that theme because he's not only the guy who has been helping other characters work out their problems, he also has a lot of his own trauma that we haven't really seen him work through. Plus, he's a character who hasn't always been well served in terms of story and screen time, so it's nice to see him and the excellent Wilson Cruz getting something interesting to do. Not the best episode of the season so far, but definitely the second best behind Anomaly, and like Anomaly, an episode that pushes the story of the season forward in an intriguing direction. Now that the mystery of what the DMA is has been solved, sort of, the questions become who made it and why, along with the question that's been there all along, how can we stop it? Lots of potential there as the show sets about answering those questions, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Those are my thoughts about this episode. Let me know what you thought, but remember, my review was spoiler-free, so if you're going to include spoilers in your comments, please include a spoiler warning so that folks who haven't seen the episode yet can avoid spoilers if they want. If you want to support my channel, go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron or click the join button to become a member. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week for a review of episode six.